Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our conference on sustainable development, investment law and the European Union, a joint conference organized by NUS Center of International Law and Green Mary University um, School of Law. For those of you who have just joined, also um, I extend my welcomes. And for those who already did the second panel, many thanks for uh, being um, still with us. Um, the second panel is now going actually a step further than the book and this is something I would like to emphasize. We're shifting a little bit the perspective away from the EU as a global actor and consider a bit more the effectiveness of trade and sustainable uh, development chapter as we find them in um, trade and investment agreements concluded by the European Union. The title of the panel is Trade and Sustainable Development Chapters in EU Investment Agreements, so pretty much straightforward. We will uh, have um, a panel that uh, I think is terrific in a sense that we really have uh, the leading uh, scholars when it comes to trade and sustainable development uh, chapters. We have um, environmental expert, labor expert, dispute settlement expert, international economic law expert. I will introduce them uh, as we go along. Um, as a very brief introduction also to the um, ongoing debate on trade and sustainable development, there is really uh, currently a, um, a reconsideration also of the European Union, as it seems uh, what we have um, so far is still not satisfying uh, completely. I was mentioning in the previous panel that in 2021, there was actually a public consultation that started in July of this year, it finished um, in um, November uh, the 5th, so not very a long time ago, um, and it was done by the European Union to see how stakeholders respond to certain of the questions that the European Union put on the table uh, on the effectiveness and especially so on the enforcement of the provisions. Without further ado, let me uh, introduce um, our first speaker, uh, who is um, Professor James Harrison. Um, James Harrison is professor in, uh, at the School of Law at the University of Warwick. He teaches and researches on issues of international economic law and the transnational regulation of corporate activity. He has a particular interest in analyzing the broader social and environmental impact of economic law and regulation. Okay. He is co-director at the Center for Human Rights in Practice. He is also one of the editors at, of Lacuna magazine, and he has worked as consultant and advisor for a number of organizations. I will mention here a few such as the Council of Europe, um, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Canada, the European Parliament, but also NGOs such as Amnesty uh, International. And uh, James, I have to say, you are really the leading scholar on when it comes to assessing what these TSD chapters actually brought about in real life. And this is um, therefore really a great pleasure to have you on this panel. And I think I'm not the only one here who can't wait to, um, to hear your insightful uh, views on TSD chapters. Thank you. Well, thanks thanks very much. Thanks, Stephanie, for the kind introduction and thanks very much for the invitation to speak and, and congratulations are gone on your book, which I, I really enjoyed reading and, uh, and, and, and is a fantastic study. So um, I'm hopefully gonna build on uh, uh, what, what, what was a great first panel uh, and I'm gonna present based on um, a six year project where I studied the trade and sustainable development chapters of EU trade agreements and their effects in three trade partners with South Korea, uh, Moldova and the Caribbean. I produced this book, I've got a little prop here, hopefully you can see that. Um, 
and we collected evidence we conducted hundreds of interviews collected a huge amount of documentary evidence and the con project concluded last year with that book um, and I've continued to work on issues of trade and sustainable development. I've written an article on the Commission's reform agenda that Stephanie talked about um, and worked there with scholars who, who've uh, looked at the impact of TSD chapters in the EU Central America and EU Colombia and Peru trade agreements. And I have an ongoing involvement in examining uh, trade and sustainability issues in the context of the EU Mercosur free trade agreement, where this topic has become very controversial. I'll say a few words about that maybe towards the end. Um, so most of my work has been on the trade issues, but much of what I have to say applies to investment as well. And I'll try to draw some lessons across from trade to investment where applicable. So I propose to frame my remarks around three questions. Uh, why are TSD chapters present in EU trade and investment agreements? Uh, what has happened in practice as a result of TSD chapters being present in those agreements? And thirdly, what should the trade and sustainable development agenda look like in the future? So, yeah, why, why, first question then, why are they in those agreements? And Stephanie gave you a kind of legal answer and, a, and also a bit of an institutional answer, which I want to kind of um, draw out a little bit in a bit more detail here before moving on to a motivational answer. So from an institutional perspective, it was clear from our research that the trade and sustainable development agenda uh, provisions were, were put on the European Commission's agenda uh, as Stephanie said, following pressure from the European Parliament, supported by European trade union movement and allied NGOs. Um, and DG Trade then sought to obtain agreement from trade partners to include TSD provisions in the legal te uh, text of free trade agreements. Uh, and what we then found was that government officials in trade partner countries then took up purely defensive positions in relation to TSD chapters. Which they were not completely familiar with, they were completely unfamiliar with as part of this sort of trade negotiating agenda. So they looked at them as a threat, not an opportunity, and sought to minimize that threat. Um, so uh, institutionally, we can see that there is a domino effect whereby NGOs, trade unions, and the European Parliament pushes the TSD agenda onto the Commission, and the Commission then pushes that onto trade partner governments. Um, and I don't want to try and, and I'll come back to talk a little bit more about, about what happened in practice about that, uh, that agenda then in, in answer to my second question. But I want to give a, a motivational answer to that question. Um, the European Parliament, NGOs and trade unions had a number of different reasons why they wanted to push for trade and sustainable development chapters. And I'm going to provide sort of three very simplified concerns. Um, again, I think building a bit on what Stephanie said before. So. One concern uh, was, was about creating a level, level playing field so that neither trade partner would seek to attract trade and investment by cutting labor or environmental standards. And this rationale is based on fears around competition. A second kind of rationale for those chapters is to use trade as a tool to push for action in the trade partner country or in key global value chains to promote the rights of workers and environmental sustainability. And this rationale is based on a recognition of the power of trade to address serious labor rights and environmental problems. And the third rationale we can see for the chapters is to ensure that the trade agreement itself does not harm workers' rights or the environment, and to improve workers' rights and environmental sustainability around the world. And this rationale is based around on the fear of what trade agreements themselves do. So it's more complex than that, and there are more but uh, you can see the kind of get some sense of the range of different reasons why these uh, TSD chapters are included and why different actors might have different priorities about what they want them to achieve as a result. So my argument would be that we need to separate out these policy aims and think about the types of obligations we need to address them separately. And I'll come back to say something about that at the end of in the answer to my third question. But first of all, before going on to that, my second question then is what's happened in practice? Um, and there are two phases that I want to speak about here, uh, the negotiation of the agreements and then their implementation. So in terms of negotiation of the trade agreement, trade and investment agreements, our research found that TSD chapters were of marginal importance in the negotiation of these agreements. European Commission officials did not push trade partners to implement the obligations contained in TSD chapters and government officials trade partners saw TSD provisions as externally imposed and not their responsibility. 
Their focus tended to be on more pressing and immediate concerns, including adherence to commercial provisions in the agreement. And where they did engage, it was, as I said, defensive. So, for instance, Korean negotiators successfully demanded fewer references to international standards and the removal of any immediate obligation to ratify all fundamental ILO conventions um, in the final negotiated text. Now, that was our research that we did. And this has changed a little, I think, with regard to recent agreements. So in Vietnam, driven by uh, concerns of the members of the European Parliament and the European Council, and in alliance with domestic Vietnamese activists, there is evidence emerging of significant legal reform to labor laws before the agreement was signed. And I can put in the chat a, a link to an, uh, an article, not by me, but by others who have charted that process. And in the EU Mercosur agreement, issues of deforestation in the Amazon, the perceived weakness of the PSD chapter for addressing those issues, has really put a roadblock on negotiations at the moment. And the Commission has gone back to the negotiating table to look at that DSD chapter again. So I think the recent picture shows more attention to these issues, at least in the context of specific agreements where there are specific environmental, labor, or human rights issues. Um, and uh, that negotiating process, which is the process, the time in the uh, where that we're in, in a sense, um, uh, that there is uh, the carrot on the table of the trade agreement, and the uh, and and um, as a result, I think more uh, opportunity for the for this TSD agenda to push. Um, when we come on to look at um, uh, these agreements are coming to force, the general picture has been um, that the European Commission has not pushed the obligations in TSD chapters, and trade partners have not felt the need to do anything with them. And civil society actors have not had the power and resources to utilize them. And there's a lot been written by myself and others about civil society actors and these um, uh, institutions that are set up for civil society actors to meet between the European Union and, and trade partner countries. Um, and some of the frustrations that's been around those processes and how they've functioned. So I can say a bit more about that in discussion, but I won't say anything about that now. now. I mean, Korea is the one case where we have seen some action. We've got to remember that it took a, a number of years before the case was brought and it's not clear what it will achieve. And I know um, we're going to have further discussion about that case um, in a moment, but I suppose my context would be um, to say that it's just not clear what the implementation of that decision will be on labor issues in Korea. But at the same time, what we found in our um, in our research was, was that in Korea, we found that the commercial provisions of the agreement shifted competitive conditions in the Korean auto market, contributing to an influx of imports from the EU, and in particular Germany, and the erosion of the Hyundai Motor Group's profits, Hyundai being Korea's largest auto manufacturer. And this threatened to create adverse impact on workers in the most insecure and low paid jobs, especially those located in the lower tiers of the production network. So the TSG chapter may have had some marginal impact on labor protection in Korea, but it's not necessarily discovering, let alone tackling, trade-related impacts on the workers, so the negative impacts the agreements might be having. And we found similar um, issues, similar but different issues in our other uh, case study countries that, again, I can talk a little bit more if people are interested about. Um, so, Moving then on to my final question, which is what we should do in the future. Um, so the, the mainly people talk about stronger sanctions in the dispute settlement process, and this has dominated those kind of reform discussions that Stephanie was um, alluding to. Um, and the idea is this will create a greater incentive for trade partner governments to comply with TSD provisions. And this might have an impact on domestic protection of labor uh, rights or compliance with environmental standards. And this has been at the center of discussions. So Gracie's going to say, I think, a lot more about that in her talk. So I'm going to park that for a, for a moment and just expand it out and argue, I think, for a discussion which is broader than just looking at uh, whether sanctions are, are have enough bite or not. And I think there is a, a moment at the moment where, for the first time, certainly in, in the many years I've been looking at these issues, where that reform agenda looks possible because um, uh, Emmanuel Macron, and I'm going to quote him, who in France would be taking over the EU presidency, 
um, shortly. Emmanuel Macron has said in relation to that EU Mercosur trade agreement, which has become very controversial because of what's happening in, in the Amazon. He said, as, you, as that agreement has been conceived and designed, it cannot be compatible with the climate and biodiversity agenda. We must reinvent our trade policies so that they are consistent with our climate policies, with our biodiversity policies. It is a necessity. So, I mean, I've never heard a, a head of state before um, speaking about the, the minutiae of, a, of an element of a trade agreement and asking for it to be reinvented. And I think that means that probably there's going to be pressure for action in this area over, over the months to come. And I think in order to think what that reform agenda looks like, we need to go back to our, our objectives again and be clear about what the trade and sustainable development chapters are aiming to do. Are they about creating level playing field for trade and investment? And I think we need to think carefully about when and if a level playing field is appropriate. And we mentioned in the first you know, questions in the first session about the, uh, the, the Brexit situation and the, and the agreement between the EU and the UK. And there you do have stronger provisions, but you actually have a very different trading relationship than between um, countries where the EU is very distant from them and there are very different levels of development. So um, we need to think carefully about what what kind um, what kinds of standards look look appropriate for different kind of trading relationships to create what kind of level playing field there. But as secondly, we more also sort of think: Are they about creating more responsible traders and investors? So you know who benefits from these trade agreements and investment agreements? It's the traders and investors who are using those provisions to uh, and liberalise trade and investment and. At the moment, all we have, as I think Stephanie said, and, and Angelos also talked about, are these TSD chapters to address these issues through generalized CSR provisions that I think have generally been found by our research and others to have very, very, very limited effects, a workshop here at, the, at best. So kind of more direct obligations on, a on investors and, uh, and, and traders. And here we have a whole due diligence uh, agenda of the European Union. Um, coming about. And so can that due diligence uh, agenda be connected up to these trade agreements and these chapters? I think it's something very interesting potentially there. And then finally, are they about creating a trade or investment agreement which does not harm the rights of workers or harm the environment? And now I gave you the example of what we saw in Korea. I think if we're going to um, address those kind of issues, we have to get much more serious about the so-called impact assessment process. Um, there is a a, 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 you know, a, a reasonably good, although with, with problems, impact assessment process for uh, trade agreements on the EU side when, they, when they're being negotiated, but, practice, but very little once they're in force. And, and, uh, and what we need, I think, is a much stronger and more rigorous methodology uh, for, for investigating effects when trade agreements are in force and then taking action when we find that they're actually producing um, negative impacts on important sustainability. So I think I'll finish there. Hopefully I was within time and um, yeah, uh, thanks very much again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, uh, Professor Harrison, dear James, really many thanks for this. Um, very useful, I think, for our present discussion overview of the TSD and, and I was just thinking of, of um, what Angelos was mentioning also uh, when we said, well, uh, liberalization, if we think of the automobile industry in Korea, um, can, you know, have harmful effect and can then shade away everything nice that you have in a TSD chapters, if you don't do it coherently throughout the whole agreement, right? So this is very interesting, but I don't want to be, uh, to speak too much because this panel is all about our great speakers. And I will move now to um, Professor Laurence Poisson de Chazon, who is our second speaker. Uh, she is a person who in principle does not need an introduction. Um, it's however my pleasure to nonetheless do so. Um, professor Poisson de Chazon is professor at the Faculty of Law of the University of Geneva. She is the director of the Geneva LLM in International Dispute Settlement. She is an international adjudicator. She is an international advocate and counsel before the ICJ, before ITLO. She serves regularly as arbitrator in investment arbitration disputes. For our panel, of course, what is um, outstanding is that she was part of the 
experts under the first expert panel, so to say, established under a trade and sustainable development chapter, which is the EU Korea. So we have here, uh, well, I can't see it well. The, this nice report where her name is on and it is really a privilege to have her despite a very busy schedule. Um, many thanks uh, Professor Basson de Chazon. It's also personally of course a, 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 a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you Stephanie. So uh, as Stephanie has hinted to, we know each other from the Geneva period of Stephanie at the University of Geneva and it's a pleasure to be with her again on this panel and it's a pleasure and I would like to thank Professor Kalamita and Professor Dimo Poulos for their invitation and I'm happy also to be learning from uh, the other panelists about uh, this practice of uh, trade and sustainable development in the EU practice. And uh, as Stephanie has said, I uh, had the honor of being selected to uh, uh, sit on a panel of experts in, it was the first experiment of the EU uh, in the context of the EU-Korea uh, agreement. So uh, my sort of insights are going to be drawn from this experience. And, uh, and I'm, look I'm looking forward to discussing uh, this, this insights with the other two panelists. So the first thing that I'd like to stress, and that was stressed by Professor Harrison, is that uh, all these agreements are quite different from each other. And I think we have to take into account the specificity of the content of each of these agreements. Uh, I'd like to also add that uh, there are generations of these um, agreements and the EU-Korea is the first, is really part of the first generation of uh, the agreements, the trade agreements that included uh, sustainable development chapter. Um, the other uh, element that I would like to stress is that, as you said earlier on, Stephanie, the US also has um, a practice of negotiating uh, trade agreements with uh, sustainable development chapters, but uh, they're quite different from the ones that the EU is uh, including its, in, in its own uh, agreements and with respect, for example, to the jurisdiction, to the applicable law, or even to the sanction issue that uh, Russia will be uh, dealing with later on. So uh, that's one first thing I, want, I wanted to stress. The other uh, issue that like, uh, why am I speaking about the differences in terms of substance is because substance and procedures, procedure are linked. And um, in a way, when you have a procedure that is launched, then you're going to be assessing uh, what is uh, the jurisdiction of the panel. And the jurisdiction is going to, right, the, the Russian material jurisdiction of the panel is going to be very dependent on the, uh, on the provisions as included in a specific uh, um, agreement. So that's another uh, comment that I would like, I wanted to make. Um, the third comment is that, um, this process that was launched by the EU in 2018 and the report of the panel that Stephanie mentioned was adopted uh, on January 20, 2021, is the first ever uh, uh, panel of experts that was established to decide about such an issue. So I think that uh, with all humility, we should speak of an experiment. The procedure was tested and it was the first time that the procedure was tested and I think that there are insights to be learned and maybe issues to be corrected uh, uh, if there are other uh, procedures that are going to be launched. So with that in mind, I'd like to sort of address a few topics. Uh, the first one is uh, the, the sort of nature of this special procedure. Uh, Second point, I'd like, I will deal with a few jurisdictional and substantive law issues, and then I will uh, address issues of follow-up in terms of uh, uh, the recommendations of a panel of experts. So I said it's a special agreement, okay, negotiated between the EU and, uh, and Korea, and 
in addition to that, and that was stressed by the other panelists, is that it's a special chapter in a specific agreement. Okay, so it's distinct from other chapters, and uh, and there we only have the trade chapter. But so it's different. But at the same time, and I don't know if some of you have looked at uh, the panel, but at the same time, we considered that in fact it's part of the overall agreement and the preamble is common to, um, uh, to, 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 to all the chapters of the agreement. And so when we interpreted the, the sustainable development chapter, we referred to the preamble and I'll come back to that. I think that is important. Then this was also mentioned, but I'm going to remind it, it's a specific dispute settlement procedure. Okay, It evolves around different stages. You have consultations, and I think I'll come back to that at the end, but consultations are very important. Then there is the establishment of a panel of experts, and then there is the issue of the follow-up of the recommendations of the panel of experts. So it's different from the procedures that we have in the trade field or in the investment field. Another feature which I think is interesting is the fact that you have various stakeholders that can intervene in the course of the procedure. And I'd like to stress that um, if you look carefully at the agreement, you're going to see that international organizations and arrangements can be asked about their opinions. So there is this idea that uh, international organizations are going to provide expert opinion on certain issues dealt with, uh, or could provide their expert opinion on certain issues dealt with by the panel of experts. Um, or they could even offer, and we could think that even these organizations could be a bit more proactive if they want to also um, make their points known to the, a panel of experts. And then there is the civil society. And the civil society has different ways of being involved in the procedure uh, at the time of the consultations, but also when the panel of experts is established. And in fact, uh, uh, they we received, as a panel, we received uh, quite many submissions from uh, the civil society, both from Europe and from uh, Korea. And then would we not have had uh, COVID, the COVID pandemic, we would have met in person and there the civil society would have been able to attend the hearing of the panel of experts. So I think that there we need to take into account that the, 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 uh, the contribution of the civil society is important and should be acknowledged. And we acknowledge it, it uh, their contributions, their submissions, we discussed their submissions in the panel of experts. Now, several hurdles that we met when we uh, were established, the fact, the, per, the first one is that um, we had the COVID pandemic, so we had to face, like everybody, this situation. And there was some delay and at the end everything was online. Second is that we, the first president that was appointed uh, um, became sick and died over the, the course of the procedure, so we appointed another president. And let, that leads me to uh, something that we should take into account, is that the people that are going to be appointed are part of a list agreed upon as president, are part of a list, uh, a list agreed upon by the two parties. And it seems to me that uh, we should all pay careful attention to the people who are listed on this list because uh, sustainable development in the context of this chapter covers, the, it covers environment, it also covers labor. And it's, uh, I think, quite difficult to be a specialist, a high specialist of all these issues. So there is a need for diversity in this list. We were very lucky to have Dr. Murray as the president of uh, this panel of experts. Third, uh, third hurdle that we met was the, the, the issue of the deadlines. It, it's not just an issue of the COVID pandemic. Um, if you look carefully at the procedure, you're going to see that uh, we have two, two types of deadlines, 90 days and then 90 days for submitting the report. Um, for all those involved in these procedures, so we, you know that it's almost impossible to meet these deadlines and they are much too narrow, especially if we want to be carefully taking into account the views of the civil society and other stakeholders. And I think that there is a need to think about the accuracy of these deadlines and uh, how to relax them a bit. Now, another set of remarks in terms of jurisdiction and substantive law issues. Um, the first one is uh, the connection with trade. 
uh, I'm not going to say much, but it's uh, it's not absent. There is a connection of to trade that has to be established. And I would say that it's somewhere between trade related aspects of labor and no connection to trade. And if you look at paragraph 94 of the report, you will see it. But so we considered that there was a need for linking what we were doing to trade. On the other hand, we stressed the need that stressed that decent work, trade and sustainable development are linked and intrinsically linked. And uh, so, and we also stress the fact that all the member states and especially the EU and Korea have acknowledged that there are links between trade and labor. And so we didn't think that we should demonstrate this link uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, great emphasis but admitting that there were links that uh, were established and we had we such, uh, in this context, we had jurisdiction. It's very different from the panel that was rendered by the CAFTA uh, tribunal in the, in the context of, of the dispute between the US and Guatemala, where the provisions at stake were quite different from the ones we had to face. Then the applicable law, the applicable law I think is also interesting because it's international law. It's international law that is at stake. And uh, it's international law in, in its great variety, diversity. It's uh, uh, conventions, but also other types of instruments which have uh, uh, legal effects. And international law is going to play a very important role for interpreting the provisions of uh, the chapter. And we referred, in fact, to a lot of instruments, ILO instruments, but also uh, the Agenda 21 uh, and so on. And we also referred to human rights because if you look at the preamble of the EU-Korea um, uh, trade agreement, you will see that human rights uh, are referred to. And we consider that when we speak of freedom of association and so on, it's an issue also of human rights, which is at stake. So. There, I'd like to come back to the importance of the overall preamble of an agreement because uh, it gives us an idea of the object and purpose of an agreement, and it helps us also to interpret the provisions which are at stake. Last point about uh, uh, in terms of uh, the substantive and the, or the jurisdiction, uh, uh, the jurisdictional issue um, aspect of, of this agreement, I'd like to stress that the RTA is a two-way agreement, okay? It's binding upon Korea, but also upon the EU. And with that, what I'd like to say is that um, Korea could very well bring a complaint, okay, a complaint against uh, the EU. And that's possible under this agreement. And, um, and in fact, if you look at the report, we referred to some decisions of domestic courts in the EU, stressing that there were issues of labor law that was not really met with uh, well uh, and not and not well implemented in the context of of the EU. So it seems also to me that we should not just have this imperialistic attitude of just looking at EU imposing issues. It seems to me that other countries should also be using these agreements to also put pressure on the EU to put maybe some a bit more order in its own house. Third set of uh, comments, it's in relation to the follow-up perspective. So um, there, it seems to me that we should not just looking be looking at the implementation of the recommendations because in fact, the starting of a procedure is very important. The starting of the procedure is very important. And, uh, and, and obviously, if you look at the, at the press, at the media, Korea was not really pleased to be uh, um, brought again, to, to have a complaint brought against it. Um, and then this was transparent. So the transparency is going to play a role. And I think that uh, putting pressure through a procedure is important because uh, if you look carefully at the report and then uh, what happened afterwards, you're going to see that in fact, Korea over the last years has changed some of the issues that were dealt with by the, uh, by the, by the panel. Korea has um, become a party to some of the key um, conventions, ILO conventions and so on. So, the follow-up, I think, should be looked at from the more comprehensive uh, perspective, looking at the initiations or consultations. Then uh, when the panel of experts is uh, working, and in fact, the panel of experts, uh, there were guarantees of transparency, and you can find quite many insights about uh, the 
oral hearings because there is a summary of uh, all those these issues that has been published. It seems also to me that the fact that other stakeholders um, that the fact that other stakeholders can intervene is also important because it put pressure on the two stakeholders, and that's something which is important. Then, what has happened since uh, there is uh, a committee that has been established, uh, which uh, is um, formed by representatives of the two parties. They are discussing, and I think that the continuation of a dialogue on the basis of the recommendation is important. And I was reading the papers from the two panelists that were thinking about, you know, uh, but is this issue of the follow-ups different from what is going on at the ILO, for example? And if you look carefully at uh, uh, the reaction of the ILO uh, with respect to violations of ILO norms, you will see that it's uh, mostly based on recommendations, monitoring, and so on. And sanctions have only intervened in very specific cases and I would say it as a means of last resort okay and think about the situation of Myanmar not now but 10 years ago okay so it's just to say that for in for for the time being in the field of uh, labor law at least uh, um, sanction is not really a tool that has been envisaged by the international community this say there might be other sanctions and I think that uh, the publicity, the transparency, the peer pressure are interesting ways of uh, discussing sanctions. Stephanie asked me to also mention what was going on in the field of environmental law and there too uh, when you look carefully at uh, the procedures as such of non-compliance procedures with respect to environmental uh, agreements, uh, sanctions are rare. But it doesn't mean that uh, nothing is going on because the pressure uh, is something and maybe then it can be looked at from a perspective of conditionality, that if you're not doing what you're doing, maybe there are other things that are not going to be agreed upon or negotiated and uh, so on. So with that, I, I'd like to conclude and, uh, and say that it was an interesting experiment. It was an interesting experience for me. And I'm sure that... Uh, I hope that uh, this type of procedures are going to be sort of uh, put in place more frequently because it opens a path for dialogue between two partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Boisson Chazon. I think this is, of course, a very rich in insight of a procedure that is less known uh, to many than other international proceedings also because it's uh, not often happening and for the EU it was really the very first time. So thank you very much. I will give right away the um, turn to the next speaker to uh, Krasia Marin Duran because she will uh, follow up on the enforcement of uh, TSD chapters um, and Krasia Marie Duran is um, a professor of international economic law at the University College London. Um, she was formerly a lecturer and founding director of the LLM uh, program in international economic law at the University of Edinburgh School of Law from 2011 to 2017. And actually prior to joining academia, she served as trade officer at the delegation of the European Union to the Republic of South Korea, and also worked at the Legal Affairs Division of the WTO. Moreover, I'm going to shorten this part, but Prasya is also often a uh, expert and consultant for a number of international organizations, such as the Food and Agriculture Organization, the uh, FAO, and the OECD. She has published widely on the topic. Um, there is a whole list of really interesting articles on um, trade and sustainable development chapters that the audience is invited, of course, to consult after. And I have to say, I also benefited from her research. And um, therefore, it's really a pleasure <laughs> to have you on this panel. And with this, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and just prepare uh, some slides. So thank you very much for the nice introduction and in particular for promoting me all of a sudden. 
I'm not a professor at UCL. I'm no. only an associate professor, unlike my co-panelists. I'm not quite there yet. But thank you very much uh, uh, for promoting me. It is a real pleasure uh, for me to be here this morning with all of you and uh, to share this panel uh, with uh, um, renowned uh, uh, experts in the field, both Professor Harrison and Pro Professor uh, Boisson. So um, the question that I was asked to address is, as has been mentioned already, whether a sanction-based mechanism should be adopted for uh, enforcing trade and sustainable development provisions. So there's been a debate on this question, as, as uh, Professor Harrison already mentioned, uh, uh, going on uh, for some time. Uh, just to be clear what this debate is, uh, is about. So when the EU adopted these trade and sustainable development chapters, it saw somehow to develop an innovative model, what is often called a promotional or cooperative approach uh, to sustainable and uh, um, trade and sustainable development chapters, distancing itself from the pre-existing practice of the United States and Canada under FTAs in two ways. First, the EU sought to define sustainable development more broadly, so we have a more ambitious or wider set of sustainability commitments that will be incorporated into these chapters. But at the same time, we will have sort of a less coercive approach to implementation and, and enforcement by favoring a, a, a more cooperative uh, a, a mechanism and even though there is a panel of experts, as we have seen from uh, Professor Boisson, and which has already been activated once in the case of the EU-Korea uh, uh, FTA, um, enforcement will exclude sanctions. Yeah? So these dispute settlement procedures, these special dispute settlement procedures, will exclude the use of economic sanctions. And this is really where uh, the EU wanted to distance itself from the pre-existing practice of the US and uh, uh, Canada. So after this, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a debate emerged on whether this promotional approach is enough or whether it is too weak. And I want to say that this debate is not something that is taking part along the typical north-south divide, so EU versus developing world, yeah, some people uh, will expect, but it's also a debate uh, that is taking place within the European Union. So we have on the one side uh, the European Parliament, certain member states and certain stakeholders, as James has uh, mentioned before, that are calling for a stronger or better enforcement of these provisions, including through the use of sanctions. And on the other hand, we have the European Commission, other member states and other stakeholders that are, have continued to defend this promotional uh, uh, approach to the enforcement of trade and sustainable development provisions staying away from the use of sanction, even if they do recognize the need for some improvements. So I want to reflect, uh, provide some reflections on this question of whether or not we need to move to a sanction-based mechanism uh, for enforcing uh, trade and sustainable uh, development chapters. But before I do so, I would like to emphasize two things. First of all, that I uh, largely agree with what Professor Harrison has said before, that this question to me is secondary. I think that the a much more fundamental question facing us going forward uh, when thinking about trade and sustainable development chapter is first getting clarity and consensus on what we are trying to achieve. What do we mean by sustainable development? What are the standards uh, that we want to see implemented and enforced? Before we think about what will be the better approach uh, to enforcing them and whether sanctions will be uh, uh, um, uh, useful or better. Um, but, you know, this is the question. So my presentation is secondary, in a way, in importance to what we have heard. But, you know, it's a topic that I've been given to present. The second one is a note of caution. And that links very much to the point that was made by Professor Boisson of saying that um, this is still an experiment. It's still a learning by doing experience. And I don't think, if we think about the fact that the first trade and sustainable development chapter, the one included in the EU-Korea FTA, has only been in place since 2011, and all the others for five years or less, I simply do not think we have enough experience and evidence at the moment to make a conclusive assessment on whether the promotional approach or the sanction-based approach is better. Yeah, so my reflections are not only secondary, but also very much preliminary 
given this limited experience. So I would like to frame my intervention um, around three questions, effectiveness, legal and policy complexities, and equity concerns. The first one, effectiveness, addresses the question of whether economic sanctions will be more effective at inducing compliance with trade and sustainable development uh, provisions that the current promotional uh, cooperative approach. This compliance inducing effect is some of economic sanction is soft, often assumed by the proponents in the debate of this uh, uh, sanctions based model as a, as a means to enforce trade and sustainable development chapter. It's something that is often assumed. They don't uh, uh, um, come into a, a debate of whether they are really being more effective. It's something that is a, a little bit lightly assumed. And I think that we should be very careful um, in doing that, as Professor Boisson uh, uh, has already mentioned, because the empirical evidence that we have on this presumed compliance-induced effect uh, uh, of economic sanction is rather scan, limited, and modest as best. We have uh, we can see that when we look at the WTO experience, when it comes to the use of economic sanctions to uh, bring about compliance uh, with trade uh, uh, commitments. I've given you some data there as of October 2020, trade retaliation in the WTO has only been authorized in two, uh, requested and authorized in 12 disputes out of over 500 that have been brought to WTO for resolution. It has only been applied in six of these 12 cases. And in, not in all of these six cases, it has led to compliance yeah, with the WTO ruling at issue. When it comes to using sanctions to bring about compliance with sustainability commitments, similarly, we can look at the EU own experience under the general system of preferences and the withdrawal of tariff preferences or to, uh, from certain developing and least developed countries so as to bring about compliance with core labor standards. And there again, we can see that the effectiveness has been limited. So definitely not something we can lightly assume that economic sanctions are effective at bringing compliance where other mechanisms have failed. Similarly, I don't think we should uh, lightly assume that the lack of sanctions necessarily mean that there will be no compliance. And I agree here with what Professor Boisson has said that the EU-Korea labor dispute in this sense is a test uh, 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 case for the EU promotional approach. So the follow-up to that panel of experts recommendation what happens with it and the extent to which uh, uh, Korea complies with them, um, uh, I think is important and will provide us a little bit more insight as to whether this promotional approach is working in practice or not. From the latest uh, 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 view that I see on the, on the meeting of the last joint uh, uh, Trade and Sustainable Development Commi uh, Committee, I think there's been some progress by Korea with, uh, already with complying with the panel recommendations. And I can say, a little bit more on that um, in the uh, uh, question and answer time. The second uh, uh, thing that I want to bring up is that introducing sanctions as an enforcement mechanism raises a number of legal and policy issues and questions, both for the EU and for uh, the EU and its trading partners more generally. And in order to make that argument, I wanted to uh, base myself on what I, I think are the two main provisions in trade and sustainable development chapters, which a little bit reflect the different uh, motivations that Professor Harrison highlighted be before, uh, before behind these chapters. So on the one hand, we have what I have called the international standards clause. So a clause that in essence requires the party to uh, uh, respect uh, and uh, effectively um, uh, implement those ILO conventions or multilateral environmental agreements they have ratified, and a non-regression clause, which go above and beyond those standards and prevent the parties from derogating or otherwise failing to effectively enforce any of their environmental and labor laws in a manner affecting bilateral trade and investment. Both of these clauses are mandatory and therefore more likely to be the ones that are uh, 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 um, so to be enforced in the future uh, uh, through the dispute settlement uh, uh, procedures in this chapter, but there is a very important difference between them is that 
The first, which is the one that was at issue in the EU uh, uh, Korea labor dispute, has no textual connection to trade. In other words, the violation thereof is not conditional upon demonstrating any actual effects on trade. The second does have that connection, yeah, in a manner affecting bilateral trade on investment, and therefore a violation thereof is made conditional upon the complaining party demonstrating a direct effect on trade. So what uh, 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 introducing sanctions will mean uh, uh, for all this? Starting with the international standard clause, this is a complicated, a tricky one for the EU. Because the EU, and I don't want to bother you with complex issues of EU constitutional law, but to keep things simple, the EU has very limited competence for labor matters. In other words, there is very little, legally speaking, that the EU can do to ensure respect for fundamental ILO conventions or uh, uh, to comply with the non-regression uh, uh, clause because the EU does not really legislate in these areas. It is the member states and therefore it is the member states that uh, uh, can ensure compliance uh, with these clauses, including fundamental ILO, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, fundamental uh, 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 labor rights, such as the right of collective uh, uh, bargaining, for instance, and, and freedom of association. So this puts the EU obviously in a, in a, in a difficult position. Let's imagine, yeah, as, as Professor Boisson was saying before, this compliance with this provision is obviously meant to be bilateral, yeah, not, unila not unidirectional, that Korea finds that the uh, one or more of the member states has failed to comply with one or more of the eight fundamental ILO conventions yeah, that they are expected to effectively implement and brings a challenge against the EU. They succeed in the case and therefore they impose economic sanctions against the EU. What can the EU actually do yeah, to ensure compliance by that defaulting member states? When the EU, as I said, is not capable under its own a, a constitutional framework to regulate on these labor uh, matters. Um, the second uh, uh, issue, oh, sorry, the second aspect uh, why I think introducing uh, sanctions will make things more complicated is in terms of the non-regression clause and this trade investment effect condition that we need to meet in order to show a violation. As Professor Boisson has already mentioned, this trade investment effect test or condition places a very high bar on the complainant to establish a, a violation. And we clearly saw that in the US Guatemala labor dispute where the US was incapable of showing that the violation of, uh, by Guatemala of its domestic law had an effect on bilateral trade and investment. Now the proponents of the sanction model say, well, this is very easy. What you should do is to get rid of this trade and investment effect condition. Yeah, get rid of it, yeah? introduce sanctions and get rid of the trade and investment effect condition. My concern is that if we introduce sanctions, if the EU insists on introducing sanctions, what we will have is the reverse, yeah? that partner countries will be insisting on introducing this trade and investment effect condition, not only for the non-regression non -regression clause as it is now, but for all the other clauses in the trade and sustainable development chapters, uh, uh, including the international standards clause, which currently doesn't have it, thereby making uh, the enforcement of these chapters in practice much more difficult because that condition is much more difficult, is, is very difficult to establish. My final point, uh, um, Stephanie, is one on equity. This one is very straightforward, while the other points that I have mentioned, I think, are uh, subject to debate and discussion. I think that if we are thinking about compliance with these uh, 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 chapters as a genuinely reciprocal, bilateral yeah, issue and not a, a, a one directional one, it becomes very evident that economic sanctions uh, uh, raise uh, um, important equity concerns. Again, when we look at the WTO experience, it is very well documented that economic sanctions and inherently inequitable as an enforcement tool when you have parties that are uh, have significant uh, uh, um, difference in their market size and therefore 
their retaliatory power, and in other words, their capacity to use trade retaliations and to sanctions. Yeah, we have seen that in the EC Bananas uh, case with Ecuador or in the US gambling with Antigua. And in fact, when we look at the six uh, uh, cases in which trade retaliation has been actually applied, it has only involved countries that are at a relatively uh, equal level of development, the EU, the US, Canada and Japan. We've never seen a case of successful uh, compliance inducing retaliation in the WTO where a small economy yeah, uh, 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 was targeting a big economy. We have never seen that and I don't think for practical reasons we will see it uh, uh, in the future, but I can elaborate a bit more on that. What does that mean for us and for trade and, and sustainable development provisions is that if that sanctions were introduced, these will translate in practice into a one-way enforcement mechanism most of the FTAs, arguably not in CETA, arguably not if we conclude one with the US in the future or, or, or in the one with Japan, but in many others, yeah, Colombia and, you know, in, in, in many others, even with our Asian uh, uh, partners. And I, I conclude on this point by putting a little bit uh, uh, of a critical note on the debate uh, uh, over sanctions. And I think that this debate so far has been largely framed uh, uh, around a way that sees compliance with uh, trade and sustainable uh, uh, provisions as mainly one directional, as mainly whether and to what extent the EU should use its market size and, 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 and trade power to improve environmental and social conditions in partner countries. There is very little discussion as uh, uh, to whether these uh, 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 chapters are also about uh, ensuring compliance with these very same sustainability commitments uh, uh, by the EU. And I think this is something we need to move away from and, and, and we need to, uh, uh, um, I don't think the success of these chapters can only be based on a discussion on uh, uh, whether the EU is capable to improve the situation abroad, but whether also third parties are able to tackle uh, 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 lacks of compliance in uh, within the EU, which as Professor Boisson showed, also exists. So we need to move towards seeing compliance with the chapters as something that is genuinely a two-way street. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Gracia. And I and I like this last comment of, uh, yeah, it's not all about uh, the EU looking at uh, the labor and environmental situation in third countries, especially since we're here in Singapore and this is also relevant for, you know, the Asian partner countries such as Vietnam, Singapore, um, that are here in the region. I, we have approximately uh, 15 minutes left for our um, um, Q&A session. Um, before I um, take some uh, questions that we got from the audience, I thought to uh, ask uh, Professor um, Harrison and Professor Boisson Chazurn, as they spoke uh, before, if they want to comment on any of the points that have been made uh, by, um, by the previous speakers. So, yeah. Professor Harrison, is there something you want to uh, to comment, maybe in, in one or two minutes, um, based on the on the two speakers? No, no, I thought they were great presentations, and just very happy to move straight on to uh, to, to questions. So happy to, happy to okay. leave it there. Um, what about um, Professor Brasson Chazun? Do you want to make any comment of what we just heard from from Prashya? Yeah, just more generally, I think that. Um, when it, in international law states of parties or the international organizations are negotiating agreements and uh, there is this principle of good faith. So if uh, in the case of Korea, Korea is a party to the, the agreement and I, I don't see why we should be putting in doubt the fact that Korea is not going to be taking into consideration in good faith the recommendations of the panel of experts. And in fact, it has sh shown that it's uh, it's taking them seriously. There are certain steps that have been achieved and then there is a dialogue. And it seems to me that this idea of sanction is uh, something which is polluting the fact that uh, commitments, pacta sunt servanda and so on, are playing an important role in international relations. As a means of last resort, maybe we could speak about it, but otherwise there are other tools in international relations. Thanks. Thank you very much. So we have um, 
And one first question that is actually addressed to the research conducted by Professor Harrison, um, when we think about real life, I always call them real life uh, effects somehow, I just to show that this is really not uh, about, you know, the, the legal um, provision itself, but really what we see in the country. And there is a question of how uh, these, what is the methodology of such, um, such a research um, to assess impacts? It's a great question um, and uh, there are lots of the answer is there are lots of different methodologies so um, broadly speaking myself and other researchers who do research like me would use quality what we call qualitative research methodologies so we would do interviews with key informants and we would review documentary evidence to build up a picture of what informed sources say about the effects of those laws so um, uh, we would interview business representatives, trade unions, environmental groups, both those knowledgeable about the trade and sustainable development chapters and those that we think should be. So one of our findings of our study was that people we would expect to know about those trade and sustainable development chapters in the countries actually had very limited knowledge of them. They knew about commercial provisions of the agreement, but they didn't really know about these trade and sustainable development chapters, which shows you that their actual, um, uh, the way that they permeated um, uh, the consciousness of key actors is actually very limited in those kind of countries. Other researchers adopt very different methodologies for looking at um, effects. So they might do quantitative research methodologies, often favoured by economists who are looking at trying to show that there is a kind of economic cause and effect. Um, and actually, there's quite a difference on this issue. Um, so some of the um, economists who've looked at um, trade and sustainable development chapters have tried to argue that they have had quite significant effects in um, in other countries. And there's a there's a chapter in our book, again to plug it, um, I think it's chapter three of our book, where we go through the, all those research methodologies and we, we do a bit more of fine-grained analysis of different kinds of qualitative sort of case study regret, uh, and other kinds of methodologies on the quantitative side and different on the quantitative and try and trying to explain why a little bit why we think those differences are occurring and our argument is that a lot of that quantitative research doesn't look at causality so it doesn't say that trade and sustainable development chapters cause impacts it can't give a causal story and that we think a lot of the um, effects that um, they're claiming seem to be based on the trade agreements as a whole rather than and their effects rather than the trade and sustainable development chapters per se so there's a big, big discussion about um, about methods, and we're constantly, as researchers, refining and, and talking to each other about how we how we go about doing empirical research. Um, and there are certainly sort of twenty or so other researchers in this field who I would speak to regularly and have conferences with, where we talk about our research methodologies and try and try and refine and enhance them. But also, for instance, I'm doing an event after Christmas where I go and. For, talk to some of the quantitative researchers about their research findings and we try and sort of bridge those gaps between economists and and, uh, and sort of lawyers and political scientists and geographers um, and try and understand why we have come to very different conclusions. Thank you very much. I think I was just about to, to follow up and to clarify that, yes, this research methodology requires really interdisciplinary approach and, um, you know, that what you just mentioned it, that you work actually uh, with economists, you work with political scientists uh, to make um, all this um, a, I am, yeah, a good methodology with insights from, from various science. This is um, fascinating, I think. We had um, a question of a person who, who left already, but I would like to build on um, a brief question to um, Professor Boisson de Chazouan, um, maybe also to Krasia if you, if you would like to. And this goes a bit on the content. Would it be counterproductive? Would it be good if the European Union or maybe also other um, states um, put even more substantive topics. Uh, so of course there will be more, the European Union is already going in this direction, there will be more on climate change, uh, there will be more on biodiversity, uh, should there be more, for example, should there be also health? Um, so and gender questions, you know, there are also uh, gender equality questions because this whole sustainable uh, development agenda is of course a big pot where you can put a lot of things. So would this be uh, beneficial or counter 
productive for um, the effectiveness and the yeah of tr trade and sustainable development chapters. Maybe I'll start with uh, saying that, and I'm not a specialist of these uh, agreements, and uh, Grisha, Grisha and, and James might com complete that. But if you look at the content of these chapters, you see that uh, already they have evolved. And I say that the EU-Korea was a treaty of the first generation, and uh, it was, I think, an interesting achievement, experiment. But then if you look, and I really look, glance through the CETA uh, agreement, the CETA agreement is much more precise on issues of labor law. Uh, you have uh, issues of safeties, which are uh, dealt with. You have issues of inspections also, which are dealt with in this chapter. So that means that, uh, and that's what I said, you know, each treaty is going to be different, uh, one from each other. And I think there is room for, being a bit more precise in the content of uh, these, uh, these chapters. Um, the second comment that I'd like to make is that uh, I'm not so sure that sustainable development is only environment and labor law. And it seems to me that uh, there might be room for other issues. And it seems to me that uh, public participation is an important issue that has to be dealt with. It's not just freedom of association in terms of trade unions, it's much more. And uh, so there, there is room, I think, for uh, sort of revising, updating these chapters. And uh, I hope that, uh, in fact, the two partners are going to, because it's not only the European Union, it's also the other partner which has a say in these negotiations. And uh, so for me, there is room for evolution. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, Krasha, do you want to add something, you know, on this issue of adding more um, topics, uh, but at the same time, you know, improving also the, uh, the precision of, of the, of the provision? Uh, no, the, this, the, I fully support what uh, Professor Wasson has just said. I think that the content of this chapter is necessarily uh, something that will evolve over time because the very concept of sustainable development is inherently on, ongoing the evolution in international law. And I think necessarily these chapters will follow that international evolution. Perhaps to add on the environmental side, since we've been mainly talking about labor and I'm a little bit more of an environmental expert. Um, I think that uh, um, there is room for the EU to consider whether um, we don't need also there to identify a set of core environmental uh, uh, agreements, multilateral environmental agreements, in the same, following a little bit the same approach that we have with the fundamental ILO conventions, from which uh, um, there can be no derogation. That's it, you know, you I, either you are a party and, 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 and ratify those MEAs because they are considered core to international environmental law, or there is no FTA. Uh, they don't have that approach uh, towards the, um, the the environmental pillar, and it's something that sort of disturbs me. I don't think the EU should be concluding FTAs agreements with countries that, uh, um, you know, refuse to uh, ratify or implement Paris or the Biodiversity Convention, such as the United States, for instance. But that's my personal opinion. Yes, thank you very much. Um, time. Oh, James, you want to intervene very briefly? You can make. Just very a... briefly to say, yes. I think that's exactly the issue that's come up in the EU Mercosur agreement. That, yeah, I think it's a very interesting one to follow for people who are interested in those kind of that's issues. True, that, James. That's true. Yeah. Uh, so I think that proves, uh, shows your point here that, that you know the EU's attitude to Brazil and, and what's going to you know watch that space mm -hmm. because there is a process mm -hmm. where the Commission has been forced to go back and and look, yeah. look at, again at the trade and sustainable uh, obligations and uh, yeah. you know we'll 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 wait and see what happens there. Mm -hmm. Good very point. Very good point. Yeah. 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 So time is flying. This is the, the thing when you have uh, excellent speakers. Um, even myself as a moderator, I have a hard time to, 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 to stop you, I really have to say. Um, we um, have to stop here. I see also that the audience is not, uh, I don't have more questions from the audience. I think they are very uh, sorry, impressed. Uh, Stephanie, yeah? because I saw something in the chat that was directed to me. Can I clarify? Was it? Yes, yes, of course. I'm very uh, sorry. Very, very briefly, because I don't want a, a confusion on this thing that I have said about the EU having limited competence for labor standards. All right. No, don't yeah. worry. We have two minutes more for you. No problem. Yeah. J just uh, uh, 
Yeah, just to clarify it. So, you know, that I was saying they have very limited competence for labor standards. So what can they do uh, when it is really, on, it is not the EU, but it is really the member state defaulting on these obligations because they are the ones that are implementing uh, most of the labor legislation uh, um, in the union. Um, I need to clarify here that the issue, these questions be becomes in particularly problematic or races in particular, in the context of FTAs that have been concluded after EU Singapore as EU only agreements. Yeah. So only the EU is a party to that agreement and therefore only the EU has responsibility under international law to ensure compliance with this agreement. You cannot bring an action against the individual member states. You can only bring an action against the EU. The EU has exclusive responsibility in international law, but effectively can do very little in practice Yeah, when it comes to implementing these commitments for labor, not for environment, for labor Yeah, internally because of its own internal legal order. That reasoning does not apply to the FTAs that were concluded before uh, Opinion 215, yeah, as mixed agreements. EU, Korea, to give one example, yeah, or, but the one with Colombia and Peru as well, for instance, yeah. Uh, uh, that does not apply because these are concluded as mixed agreements with both the EU and the member states being a party, both having responsibility under international law to ensure compliance, and the partner countries being able to bring a challenge against either or, yeah, the EU or the member states, depending on who, who they think is, is, is defaulting on compliance. Yeah, so just to clarify that for Justina Lazek, I think. Okay, so sure. I think, yeah, probably you got the message um, directly to you and because I have, ah, not, okay. I have not seen it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. also my apologies, of course, uh, to you and, and to... So there is, a, there is a difference, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, exactly, for, yeah, yeah. Going forward, most of the agreements will be concluded by the EU. So it's only in the very first agreements that what I have said does apply. Going forward, they will be, they are being concluded only by the European Union. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, um, Prasya, and thank you um, once again to all the panelists for outstanding um, interventions. Um, I come to the end of the panel, but not yet to the complete end of this conference, because we also have the pleasure to hear again Dr. Angelos Dimopoulos on some concluding remarks. So he will close the door, but then he will also open the window and give us an outlook of uh, what uh, can we all, you know, take away from this discussion. And uh, now it is um, 42. I think we can run a little bit over 45. Uh, and um, Angelos, please feel free to, to mention your key points. And if you run over uh, five minutes uh, late, I think, and I hope that this is not a, a big problem for all participants. From my side, I thank um, all of you again. I thank the audience. I thank CIL. I thank Q Queen Mary University and uh, say goodbye and hopefully until soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And let me start by thanking uh, 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 those who attended this event and of course our speakers and the excellent uh, speakers in the second panel and of course in the first panel for uh, this stimulating discussion. Because what I, th I wanted to go in my brief conclusions is to say that the past three hours I learned a lot and this is a topic that is worth discussing for three hours and for more because I have many questions to you and to the panelists in the second panel which you don't have the time. But I think it's a topic worth uh, uh, examining in more detail. And your book is worth reading for dealing with this question for what I think would be three key reasons. The first is that the, you bring something new to the table. And I think we've heard from you from the beginning how the EU shapes the debate on investment and sustainable development. I think we heard, uh, although the EU may not have been willing, as James mentioned, they still have introduced a completely new chapter on TSD, which as Gracia indicated, it is different from North American approaches. It's something new and unique. Well, yeah, you, Stephanie and, uh, and August discussed at the beginning, uh, explaining how there is a renewed emphasis on interpretation and there are new rules in the substantive standards, focusing in particular on regulatory autonomy. It's new if we focus on investment liberalization, which is something that the EU is doing in comparison to all other major global international players. And 
the, the, we discussed, I think, uh, on how the, the use approach brings the opportunity to have a, a discussion that was not held in the past. And I think Laurence mentioned before that there, is a, there was a discussion on human rights under the EU Korea TSD, and it was only a first generation, but this is a debate which in investment and sustainable development until and very recently was considered a taboo <laughs> uh, topic and was hardly ever touched upon by any investment uh, arbitral tribunals. The second point, and I think this is why we need to keep uh, having discussions like today, is because the use approach is new, innovative, and definitely worth examining, but it's imperfect. And there are lots of the things that we discussed today where we need to reflect and reconsider what the EU is doing. I'll start from the chapter on TSD with uh, excellent remarks from all the participants. The point that James and Gracia elaborated on that we don't even, we are not yet sure what the key objective is. Is it to create, to maintain a level playing field or is it to mitigate the negative effects of uh, trade liberalization on sustainable development? Which of course affects enforcement. And I don't want to reiterate the, the points that Gracia made on whether we need to move from a soft cooperative approach to a, 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 a different approach. On the point that you highlighted earlier, Stephanie, on the liberalization, that the emphasis on performance requirements is the one that, which indicates that there are parts of these investment agreements which do not contribute to sustainable development. And James made an excellent link from practice <laughs> the, illustrating that point with uh, the impact of trade liberalization in the Korean automotive industry and within the domestic labor market in Korea. There are more points to discuss on how we can improve, but uh, the last point that I want to say is that uh, how that the EU seems to be willing to learn. And from what we are hearing, there is a lot of interest in reshaping and reforming that debate. You started mentioning, you started, Stephanie, your presentation by talking about the new Commission communication on trade and sustainable development. Uh, James addressed the, the, the renewed political interest in this part of trade agreements. I think uh, uh, th there was, uh, if we see to the actors participating, Laurence uh, highlighted the importance of transparency, both at the stage of negotiations and at the stage of a dispute settlement or if we call it dispute settlement, the recommendations of the resolving of disputes or contributing through the interpretation of these chapters to the, to, the, to, to the objective of these agreements. James mentioned about the different public act actors involved, the NGOs, um, trade unions, and Laurence also explained the importance of these actors participating at different stages throughout the life of these agreements. And I think this is important in making sure that the EU is willing to listen and to improve upon the points that where this debate can be further improved. And to bring that with a comment that I made at the end, which would be, what is the institutional framework within the EU to have all these voices heard and come out in, a, in, a, in an outcome which is coherent, clear, and legitimate. And I think this is a point where we may need to review and revise the internal institutional framework within the EU on how the policy, uh, uh, trade policy is formed and how trade policy is implemented via the negotiation and conclusion of international agreements and via the implementation of these international agreements. And here I will stop. And before I finish, because I think I'm not passing the floor back to you, let me again thank very much everybody for participating in this event. It has been a great honor and pleasure to discuss. And I think, as I, as, I, as I said in my closing remarks, we'll have plenty more opportunities and I'll have, we have an opportunity to discuss again these questions and newer developments, 
hopefully in a face-to-face -face environment, but also have the opportunity to, to uh, have an audience as the one that we had today that was uh, from all over the world. Again, thank you all very much.